Good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you to the organizing committee and to Peter for inviting me here. It's such an honor to be here, and in particular to be sharing the stage with Henry Matthias, who, whose work I greatly admire. So I'm looking forward to your talk. Uh, so what we're talking about today is, is risk and risky play, and what are our risk perceptions around what kids are allowed to do? Um, and to give you a, a bit of background, I'm um, a developmental psychologist, but I've been doing injury prevention research for about 20 years. Um, and so where I'm coming from is really, uh, as my career developed, a concern that our best intentions around keeping our kids safe were actually overprotective and doing harm. Um, so what we're going to cover today really is the what, why, and how of outdoor play and risk. What is it? Why is it important? And how do we support it? And by the way, this is my son, <laughs> engaging in risky play. So no, uh, no talk about this is complete without our thinking about our own childhood play memories. So I would invite you now to close your eyes if you're comfortable and really take yourself back there to your favorite childhood play memory. And I want to think about you to think about where you were, who you were with, what you were doing, what kinds of sights, sounds, smells you were experiencing at that time. Okay, so I want you by a show of hands to tell me how many people were outside. Hands up. Okay, I think it's pretty much everybody. Okay, how many of you were taking risks? <laughs> Again, I think pretty much everybody. How many of you were in what I consider leftover spaces? So not formal playgrounds, but play spaces like the streets around your home, forest, ravines, ditches, pretty much everyone as well. Uh, how many of you think that your parents were bad parents for letting you do what you did? A little bit, <laughs> Anders. <laughs> So it's quite a contrast, really, um, in terms of what we see today. Um, but I want you to think a bit further about your favorite childhood play memory. And why are so many of us outside? What is it about being outside that is so compelling for children? And so we've asked this question around the world gotten very, you know, different people to tell us their story. And there's some kind of universal themes that come out of this. People talk about a feeling of joy about being outside, freedom to be able to do what they want outside of the eyes of adults telling them what to do. Being able to meet up with their friends and decide for themselves what the activities are going to be, what their goals are, what they're going to do, how they're going to resolve disputes. Finding leftover spaces and making their own kind of hidey holes and, and taking ownership of those spaces. Being able to move their body, big movements, shouts that they can't do indoors. Being out in nature and the healing effects of nature. So all sorts of things like that. And those things might resonate with you and your own favorite childhood play memory as well. Now, what's interesting is you can actually map all of those characteristics onto child development, health, and well-being. And so what we find is that outdoor play is actually different from indoor play, and it offers very different developmental benefits and outcomes. So for example, hanging out with your friends, figuring out what you're going to do, resolving disputes, that's really important for socio-emotional development. Setting your own goals, the steps to attain those goals, focusing your attention on those goals, really critical for executive functioning and cognitive development. Moving around, being able to run around and do things like you want, that's really important for physical activity, physical literacy, and all sorts of kind of gross and fine motor movement skills. And, so, and what we find too is that when kids are allowed to figure out for themselves how they're going to do things and solve their own problems, well that's really important for self-confidence, resilience, and really their mental health and well-being. Um, and so what we find really is, is that play, an outdoor play, is the engine of optimal child development. It's absolutely critical. And as I mentioned, I'm an injury prevention researcher. So the other thing that I highlight is that there is no other way 
to learn how to manage risks without actually taking risks and managing them. So if we want to keep our kids safe, we actually have to let them take risks. So we've seen quite a decrease in play with the current generation. So what happened to play? Where did it go? Where there's a number of very complex factors that have come into play over time, including, for example, urbanization and car-centric cultures and all of that affecting kind of social cohesion levels. But one of the big things that I look at is parenting and parenting approaches, and that's really changed quite fundamentally since the late 80s. And so we're seeing a, much, a move towards intensive parenting, towards parents being much more involved in their kids' lives, curating their childhood, and also a sense that children are less competent and capable than we used to think they were. And this is really coming out in the data. So for example, these are Swedish data around children being able to walk unaccompanied to different places. And so you can see that in 1981, the vast majority of these are seven to nine year olds were able to walk alone to all sorts of places in their neighborhoods. By the time the survey's done again in 2009, it's already gone down in, in the case of school to 46%. And thankfully it's staying fairly stable at that point. But what we find with research in other countries is we see the shift in the 90s. The big loss in children's independent mobility and ability to just go outside and play happened in the late 80s, early 90s. So what is it that's concerned of us? Why, what are we so afraid of? Why is it that we're not letting kids out to play? Um, and so, you know, I'm an injury prevention pre researcher, so I focus on these things. And, and what we see in our research is that there are kind of three big fears that overwhelm parents. You can probably guess what they are. Kidnapping, their child getting hit by a car. And the third one was a little bit odd for us, but it turns out that they're very worried about what other parents will think of them. And in Canada and in, in, in the States, they're also worried that social services will be called if their kid's out playing. So let's look at the data. How likely is it that these things will happen? Well, I had a look at um, the kidnapping statistics. I couldn't find them for Sweden, I apologize. But these are in Canada. The risk of abduction by a stranger is so remote we don't even keep stats on it. But last time that a study was done, it, it, the rate was about one in 14 million. So just to give you a sense of what that means, you'd have to leave your child unattended for about 200,000 years for them to be kidnapped by a stranger. And again, these are Western country data, you know, so also within the context of, of other countries, um, it might be different. But in Canada, it's extremely, extremely remote. Okay, what about um, injuries? Well, here's again the Canadian statistics for deaths from unintentional injuries in Canada from 1950 to 2009. What do you notice here? It's going, it's going, really going down, right? So in fact, what we have here is a situation where Canadian kids have never been safer, ever. And so sometimes I'm asked, okay, you know what? Overprotective parenting is working. So we, we're keeping kids safe because they're not allowed to do anything. Right? Maybe that's why. But in fact, um, maybe it helps to say in 1950, the leading cause of death for kids, any guesses? Cars, motor vehicle crashes, kids in cars. 2010 and now, leading cause of death for kids, any guesses? Cars, still cars, still cars. So what's driving this trend? It's car safety. What happened in the 70s in most countries? Seat belts. So you can track these drops. For example, in Canada, we have uh, 10 provinces and, and two, three territories now to when seat belt laws came in, um, dr you know, drunk driving laws, those sorts of things. So the, what's driving this trend is, is car safety. It's not pedestrian safety, it's car safety. Of course, the other things contribute but really it's the bulk of it is cars. And in fact, the same thing's happening in Europe. So child injury deaths in Europe region from 2000 to 2015 
have dropped by 47%. And if you look a bit further down on this table, you'll find that cars, road traffic injuries, are the primary contributor to these. So again, the trends and patterns are very similar. And in fact, in Sweden, you might be surprised to know you have the lowest child injury rates in the world. You are number one. You should be very proud of this. We've been looking to Sweden for many years, many decades. You've done some pretty amazing things in terms of your child injury statistics. And so the likelihood of a child getting injured here is even less remote than in Canada. Now, what about ending up in hospital? Well, for example, these are, this is a systematic review of medically treated injuries for six to 12 year olds for active commuting, uh, sports and leisure time. And the results indicate that play has the greatest number of medically treated injuries, but once you take into account the time spent doing the activity, it's the lowest. So it goes down to 0.15 to 0.17 medically treated injuries per 1,000 hours of activity. Sports is actually the highest. So how do you interpret this number? A child would need to play outside three hours a day for approximately 10 years to log the time they needed to get one medically treated injury, and even then, it's likely to be minor. So as an injury epidemiologist, my concern is not play, it's traffic and suicides. Those are the big killers. But the situation we have here that is in fear that death can take away our children we're taking our children away from life. So how do we bring back play? Well, Play Wales has outlined three key ingredients which are backed up by our own research around outdoor play supportive environments. Time, space, and freedom. So giving, making sure that time is a, it's a priority for kids to play outside, that they have adequate access to space and that the space is good quality space, and that the freedom, they have the freedom to do what they want. And the biggest barrier to freedom is us, adults. And so there's really exciting work going on across the country and the world really around this. We have our own research on adults, our own tools for adults that are online. I'm happy to tell you guys about them um, and lots of interesting things. So I'm actually very optimistic in terms of the direction that we're heading. So what I hope is clear to you is why play is important for kids, why play is important not just for kids, but for all of us, and why we are important to play. Because what's really key is that in order to make a difference around play, it's a multi-sectoral effort. We have to work together across sectors to create the conditions for kids' play. So what I want you to think about is what is your why? What is the thing that will drive your passion to move this issue forward? It doesn't matter what it is. And I hope you can see that outdoor play actually offers so many benefits. So it's finding what's really key to you that's gonna keep you energized and moving forward. And what's the one thing that you can do the next time you're at work, tomorrow even, that can make a difference for children's play? This is my contact information. Please feel free to contact, reach out. I would love to hear from you. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mariana.